this panel is going to talk about uh, credentialing and um, we're going to demystify credentialing, explain what in the heck it is, um, everything you wanted to know about credentialing, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, so um, one of the things I just wanted to mention is that um, in our framework that the sort of this refresh that we did a couple of years ago, one of the things that you had all suggested that we focus in on is diversifying um, our portfolio a bit. So we try to attract some grant resource. And so um, this, this is part of that. So we uh, were approached um, in part by Ken Sauer, who is from Indiana, one of our commissioners, who kept talking about the importance of credentialing, um, an organization called Credential Engine. We partnered with them and that got support and funding from Ascendium, which is a funder, um, formerly Great Lakes in Madison, Wisconsin. And so um, Jenny Parks, our v one of our VPs and uh, the panel here are going to walk you through that work and then give you some practical examples of what's happening in their states. Jenny? Oh, one more thing before, uh, for those of you coming to the Ford Museum, I'll meet you downstairs at 115. We'll walk across, um, if, if that works for you, we'll walk across to the museum. Um, the tickets are on my phone and Rob's phone. For those of you that are joining us, I know Connie's going to join us a little bit late. Her, hers is at two. And it's about as far of a walk as last night when we went over to the, to the other um, museum. So, um, and then we'll, I'm going to probably um, cut, come back a little early because my flight's at 445 along with Rob's and a couple other people. But um, my understanding is you can go through pretty quickly. It's very interesting, um, but you should stay as long as you like. So just meet us downstairs if you want to go with the group. Okay, thanks. Jenny. Thank you. Oh, okay. There's, let me know if you don't hear me and I get this wrong. Um, well, welcome uh, to the final uh, presentation of the meeting. Um, and as she said, yes, the best is often at, at, the, at the last moment. And we definitely have some great folks here to help us with this. So um, I will tell you a little bit about the, the work we're doing in the credentialing space and specifically about our collaboration with Credential Engine um, that is being funded by the Ascendium Corporate um, Foundation. Uh, we'll hear from our grant officer, Carolyn Lee at Ascendium. She has sent along a really nice message that she wanted to share with us. She's sorry she couldn't be here in person. And then uh, you're gonna hear from three of the folks in our MEC states who have actually um, entered into an agreement and a partnership with Credential Engine to do the important work um, of that organization, but also of their own. So um, first of all, um, let's talk a little bit about credentialing. MEC actually has done a lot of work historically that touched credentialing or was kind of tangential to it. Um, we have the MCMC, the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit, which um, Sarah has run so successfully for years now. Um, and actually it is very much about credential paths and making sure that exiting service members um, and their families have access to certain credentials and that they can take certain um, military experiences and education and receive some credentials and some credit for that. Um, we also have um, a number of initiatives in the concurrent enrollment space, which might not seem quite like credentialing, but it is. It's a whole new path to credentialing and it's a different um, set of them that are emerging, many of them in all of our states each day. And then of course we have the MSERA initiative, which is all about being able to earn a credential across state lines and all of the complications and delightful uh, dilemmas that come with that. Our most recent though, and our most directly um, related to credentialing effort is the MCTA, the Midwestern um, Collaborative, um, Midwest Credential Transparency Alliance, excuse me. I'm, I have too many consortia and collaboratives with which I interact. So the MCTA um, is an alliance of the 12 Midwest states, MEC and Credential Engine. Credential Engine is a nonprofit organization that came together um, under some startup grants a few years ago, and it was led by folks in collaboration, taking big data and databases and complex um, computing opportunities and saying, hey, there's an area out there where it's, it's really a hot mess. There are all of these different credentials. And by credentials, we mean some type of certified um, artifact, if you will, that, that demonstrates or attests to certain learning experiences, outcomes, and skills. And they, there really are so many and they're expanding rapidly. The, the, the rate at which we see badges or um, certificates 
coming out is amazing and it grows every day. And the providers grow every day. We have lots of private providers, we have multiple institutions. So it, there are really so many of them. It was already a mess and now it's a bigger mess because there are so many more of them. And how does a student, a family say, well, I don't know, should I get this certificate in flower arranging or would it be better to have, you know, is this badge in this, in, in, um, in writing this in you know, Python, is that something worth me doing? And, and how does it relate to anything else that's out there? Um, so Credential Engine aspires to have every credential across the nation in a massive database that is regularly updated. And it all of the credentials within it share uh, what's called the CTDL, the Credential Transparency Descriptor Language. So you can see this is a huge, huge behemoth task. Um, and so you have to start small. In the MEC region, when we started this work, there are seven states where there was a collaboration with Credential Engine. Um, we had five states that, know, that were not, um, um, had not joined with Credential Engine to, to do some of this work. Now we are down to two that are still working on which projects would be the best ones in their states to do that. The two that, um, are still having those conversations are North Dakota and Missouri. The three that have created projects just this year are Iowa, Wisconsin, and Kansas, and our lovely speakers here um, will tell you about those efforts. So um, let's hear from Carolyn Lee at Ascendium. Ascendium is a large philanthropic organization. They used to be Great Lakes Higher Ed. Um, and they have a number of strategic priorities. And actually this was one that took a little convincing, but once they understood that this is the infrastructure from which we can build so many other efforts, uh, they were very eager and very generous. So I'll let Katie share that video with you. Greetings to you all from across the pond, Lake Michigan, that is. My name is Carolyn Lee, and I so wish I could have been with you in person, but. I am beaming in today from Eastern Wisconsin, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to greet you virtually. I'm a senior program officer at Ascendium Education Group, a national philanthropy focused on improving post-secondary educational outcomes and workforce success for learners from low-income backgrounds. And today, I'm here because I have the privilege of working closely with Susan and her great team at the Midwestern Higher Education Compact on a project supported by Ascendium's grant making. This ambitious effort called the Midwest Credential Transparency Alliance is tightly aligned with Ascendium's goal to increase diverse pathways to post-secondary education and workforce training that represent high quality, transferable, industry validated credentials. Try saying that five times fast. The credentialing ecosystem is growing by the day. Well-known credentials like licenses and industry certifications are being joined by short-term skills-based certificates and digital credentials of all kinds, issued by hundreds if not thousands of different providers. Legislators and business leaders are increasingly turning their attention to the merits of shorter-term education and training to supplement and fill gaps left by traditional degree attainment. Upskilling and reskilling are the hottest economic development buzzwords. But which credentials support demonstrable economic mobility and family sustaining careers. What do we know about the comparative benefits of non-degree credentials for individuals from low-income backgrounds, global majority learners, and first-generation students? And what do they know, workers and learners who need some form of post-secondary credential but don't have reliable information, time, or money to waste? How should they make sense of their options? And importantly, how can education and workforce leaders incentivize, support, and increase access to high quality training and credentials in support of a more skilled and diverse workforce? As with any complex system, the solutions we seek are equally complex, but they begin with credential transparency. As you all know much better than I, the complexity of state regulation, data sharing, and policy infrastructures makes it difficult to understand what credentials are available, to whom, and with what potential benefit. But we believe it is imperative to make transparent pathways to upward socioeconomic mobility more accessible, especially for individuals from low income and other marginalized backgrounds. 
And that's why Ascendium is interested in credential transparency, because the lack of it, like most barriers, disproportionately affects learners and workers with the fewest resources and advantages. Our philanthropy also invests in efforts that target systemic scaled change and the ability to coordinate credential transparency across MEC's 12 state service area through focused ongoing engagement will leverage regional momentum and accelerate progress. So as you learn more about the Midwest Credential Transparency Alliance today, I want to simply leave you with the encouragement that this work is both urgent and crucial to our shared efforts to improve post-secondary and socioeconomic equity. Ascendium is so proud to support MEC in this effort, along with their key partner, Credential Engine. And we are excited for the work ahead. So best wishes to you all as you continue your convening. And thanks again for letting me be a small part of it. Take care. So thank you for listening to what Carolyn had to say. It mirrors a lot of what I'd already shared with you, but it doesn't hurt to echo that message. So. Without any further delay, I'm going to introduce you to our three panelists, our credentialing experts. First, we have Ben Passmore. He is Associate Vice President for Policy and Research. It's a familiar title, I've heard it somewhere, um, the University of Wisconsin System. Um, and we have from Kansas, Ms. April Henry, Director of Workforce Development in for the Kansas Board of Regents, and Ms. Paula Nissen, Lead Education Program Consultant for the Iowa Department of Education. They're each going to tell you a little bit about what they're doing, how this work helps them, and, and, and how they, where they see it going in the future. So I'll start with you, Ben. Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, again, Ben Passmore. I'm with the University of Wisconsin System. And we are, just to give context, we are the uh, organization that oversees the four-year universities with public universities within the state of Wisconsin. That's it. And it reflects kind of what goes on in Wisconsin, which is everybody is doing their own thing. Maybe not quite Michigan level. I really was impressed by how like dispersed Jarl's authority was when, when you were speaking last night. But overall, we're, we're a very decentralized group. So when we were approached to participate in this, we had to ask ourselves both what does it do for the state of Wisconsin, but what can we do within the University of Wisconsin system that's of value to the state and also frankly to our institutions. And um, in the video, we heard this described as a hot mess. Yeah, I, I'd say that's a fair description of the way credentialing goes. Beyond the databases maintained by my department, my department, that's it, Office of Policy Analysis and Research, there is no central repository for credentials within the university system within uh, Wisconsin. There, I mean, we have to, we've got accreditation things and the like, there are places, but if someone wants to know, do you offer a degree in X, they have to come to us. And now think about that. that. Does that make sense? Does that make sense on any sort of like a, a level where you can plan for, for a state, for a region? It, it, it's very difficult. I tell people I'm in the knowing to doing business. And frankly, we don't know what our credentials look like in the state of Wisconsin in any sort of effective and organized way. And if you don't know, it's very hard to do much of anything with it. So the, we are really focused on moving all of our material, all of our degree level credentials into a uh, credential engine. And then we have a second step in this process where we're gonna move our sub degree level credentials which will include things that have never, that, that we don't have, but that no one has within the state of Wisconsin, things along the lines of badges, uh, continuing education courses, all these sorts of things and putting them in. So for the first time that we can actually take a look and see, this is what we have. Now, again, this is still a project that is focused within the University of Wisconsin system. So we have others to talk to about this, to kind of expand beyond what we're doing. But that's where we're starting out. And we think there's a lot of value to be had just in that work, which tells you something about where we start from. Stop there. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna have each of them tell you a little bit about what they're doing, then we're gonna open it up for a nice discussion. Okay, April. My name is April Henry. 
who directs the workforce development with the Kansas Board of Regents. And since um, you decided to explain your system, I'll give a little background of how Kansas works. So the Board of Regents, we um, govern, coordinate, and regulate all of the education within the state. So the universities, community college, technical college, private post-secondary, it's all housed under our roof. Um, about 10 years ago, um, there was a study done, 60% of all of these jobs in Kansas were going to need some type of credential. So in our last strategic plan, that was a goal. That was a goal for everyone within the state is to, to try to meet that goal. So most of our initiatives surrounded that. Um, one big one is program alignment um, across the state. Welding programs are aligned. We start with business and industry. What do you need? What credential is the most important to you to hire somebody in? And we make that a requirement of welding programs. If, it, if an institution decides not to participate, they forfeit their Perkins funding. So we do force them in a nice way to participate and listen to business and industry. Um, another thing, another initiative is Excel and CTE. Uh, if you guys haven't heard about that, it's free college tuition for Kansas students enrolled in technical courses, um, both at the community and technical college, with the intent of becoming credentialed. So when they leave high school, they have a credential, they can go to work, or they can opt to continue on with their education. Um, we also have that for adult students in AOK, -okay. so somebody not up to college level or lacking their high school diploma or equivalency could also take advantage of a free program that gets them credentialed, ready for the workforce. So we have all of this going on. Um, so credential engine was our logical next step. It's a place to put it, um, to, to submit it so that everyone can see what's happening. An interesting thing with Kansas um, is that we do have a database for all of the state funded institutions. So we have asked our state and our, all the state funded institutions to input that information into our database. So we have not asked the colleges to do any extra work our office through an API uploads it to Credential Engine every night at midnight. So we are constantly updated. Um, and within Credential Engine, yes, we have credentials, but another really cool thing that it has is program accreditation. Mm -hmm. So let's say for example, you are a nursing student and you wanna go on to advanced nursing one day, you must graduate from an accredited nursing program. You can see it. All of our institutions, they have the accreditation on there. Thank you. Thank you, April. That was, um, I will, I'll add a comment about the CTDL, the, the um, Credential Transparency Descriptor Language. I think they're up over 500 um, terms now and that you can use to describe a credential. So you, it, yes, program accreditation, but there are so many other things. Um, a number of the things that, they, that will eventually be built out is uh, placement rates, mm -hmm. average earnings, et cetera. So you can begin to see the potential for this in the future as we populate the database and gather more data. So, all right, Paula. Hello, everybody. Um, similar to what April had said, we had a study conducted that um, for Iowa by Georgetown University in 2015 that showed, illustrated, proved that 68% of the jobs in Iowa were gonna require some sort of post-secondary training or education by 2025. So our governor said, you know, 68% is not good enough um, for our folks. So we're going to make it 70% is going to be the goal for the people in Iowa. So it, knowing that moving forward, then we had to have some way to track that, to figure that out, to offer the credentials necessary for these types of positions across our state, and then um, try to measure those. So in 2006, let's back it up a little bit. 2006, we started doing credit program outcomes which includes employment wages and completions. Um, since then in 2015, since that we started working on this project um, with the governor's office, uh, we started measuring not only credit, but non-credit offerings as well. So tracking those folks into employment, um, seeing what type of credentials they, they were awarded, et cetera. So we, we have all of that in place, working with partners in workforce development, um, the Iowa College Aid Commission, our region universities, and others, and K-12 too, um, we're able to put all of these outcomes on our website. Um, it's, it's new, it's called iowastudentoutcomes.com. Go there, figure it out, it's, it's pretty cool. It's got interactive Tableau dashboards and such. So the next step then was how do we get everything in one place so that everybody knows what type of credentials are available 
um, for any I-01 across the state. We have a couple of different sites. There's a Future Ready Iowa site that's career coach based. And then we also are partnering with Credential Engines and um, MEC and, and the Alliance so that we can get all of our information out on a national site so that all of our students across the state and in other states, sorry, they may have to come to Iowa um, to see what all we have available. But in working with the team at Credential Engine, um, we're giving them the information on all the credentials for certificates, diplomas, and associate's degrees in the credit programming, but also the non-credit programs that we have at the community colleges across Iowa. So um, I'm opening it up now. Let's have a conversation. Do you have questions, suggestions, ideas? It's a, it's a big thing. Um, we, Sarah Appel, um, our Associate uh, Director for Policy Initiatives has really been the person at MEC who's worked most closely with all of the teams doing the credential engine work. And so Sarah, you might have some, some things to contribute to this as well, but our member, early on, and I don't recall who provided us with this example. They said, "This is go back, think about 20 years ago. Who, who has ever been to um, an academic library where you have, he had to fill out the cards. You remember the little cards you would fill out and they, they were carbon and then you'd have to get them and then they'd stamp, 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 stamp. And then you remember you'd go in one day and they're like, oh yeah, you still have to fill out the cards. We're gonna put the barcode on it. And then eventually, well, you don't need the cards. We'll scan the barcode. <laughs> You know, and it, think about it, at some point, there were all these books, all these journals, and they had to get into the computer before you really could know in one place and do a search of what they were. It's kind of like that. We're building the knowledge infrastructure. And if that analogy is helpful, we, for Sarah and I, it was, and we found it was helpful in explaining it to folks who aren't quite familiar with this space. So with that in mind, do we have some questions? Dr. Pink. Yeah, uh, thank you, all three of you. Great information. Um, credential engine is something that Dr. Eisler and I um, and several other institutions are digging at right now as well. Uh, two questions. Um, number one, uh, as you were talking about the work going on in your state, when I think about Michigan, what credentials really need to be and look well, what they look like on the west side of the state doesn't really look exactly like the east side of the state and Lord knows looks a whole lot different from the upper peninsula right so with a with an effort around credentials especially when you're trying to create the repository and whatever that looks like uh, question number one how are you and are you regionalizing some of this work in terms of what your regions of your states need um, I mean, you can just create the whole big box, right? And people can take from the box if that's it. Okay, uh, we're kind of going more regionally, I think, with our work at present moment. And then the second thing would be around career path. So when you talk about a credential, um, I will I will tell you that our manufacturers and others in our region right now will tell me, Bill, I don't, need a, I don't need an associate degree for this person, I don't need a bachelor's degree, I just need them to have the certificate and need them to go to work. I get that. That is very true for what they need today. Mm -hmm. But the problem that I always come back to now is, you know, that's great for that person to get that $18, $20 an hour job today, but is there truly a career path for that person five, 10 years down the road when they don't want to be holding welding a welding torch and they want to move into supervisory role um, uh, management or whatever have you, or other play parts of the organization or even outside. So uh, how much are you, do you look at that from a career path perspective in, in mapping out those credentials? Um, what does that picture look like as well as uh, if indeed that's a living wage, that, that provides a living wage job, because there are a lot of credentials out there that will get you a really, really good seven and a half, eight dollar an hour job that does nothing for uh, someone in terms of uh, what we know as Alice in our, in our area. So two, five, 10 questions. I apologize for that, but um, <laughs> comment on any of that, if you would. I'm just curious to hear more. I can go. Um, as far as regionalism goes, I can tell you that in Iowa, the community colleges are all locally governed. They're locally run, locally run and they determine what programs they will offer at the colleges based on that employer demand most of the time. 
There's also, um, so that's, that is a thing. And we do have those all in there by college region as far as what the offerings are for both credit and non-credit programs, short term to long term. Another thing that we've started talking um, to Credential Engine about and just had a meeting by the way the other day was the pathway question. Um, one of the things in Iowa we've been working toward and now have implemented is a, a it's called, a, oh shoot, now I can't even think, brain, um, transfer, the transfer uh, program that, that goes from where our regional universities have met with the community colleges. And we at the Department of Education have implemented the, this, this program that's called a transfer. And it's, it's identified by SIP code, a special SIP code, where the majority of that program will then transfer onto the university, giving that, that person, that student, an idea of that they don't have to go on to that university if they don't want to, but if they do, that career pathway is there for them and that transferability to the four-year institutions is there as well. So it's not a waste of time. It's something to look forward to moving forward. And there's 42 of them so far. Transfer majors, that's what it is. That's the words I was yeah. looking for. And so that's- I would, I would just add with our program alignment process, I know I made it sound really like stiff, but it's not. So we, we pull business and industry from across the entire state and we try to get them to come to an agreement. Uh, typically there is an agreement. So if you're thinking welding, nursing, obviously, um, the different um, types of technical degrees, typically there is an agreement on what type of credential that is required. Um, sometimes there's not. So let's take um, auto collision and repair. There's different, different um, certifications. Within our alignment, we specify those. So an institution can offer a program that leads to one of these three industry certifications. And so that we're, we're meeting the needs of business and industry. Um, but we also have a way that we make sure a credential is valid. Um, there are a lot of credentials out there that may not mean anything to business and industry. So we went through a process uh, back in 2014 um, with Roy, Roy Swift um, to determine what are our three categories to show that a, a credential is valid. Um, one, it's required by law. Two, it's supported by business and industry. So AWS for welding or ICAR for auto, um, those are supported by industry. Um, the other would be in, uh, credentials that show up in job postings. So we have um, access to um, MZ data. So we pull job postings and what are the most valid credentials that show up there? Uh -huh. If institutions want to offer other credentials, wonderful but these are the ones that we have validated with business and industry are the valid required credentials to, for employment. Get anything extra you want, that's fantastic. But these are at, at minimum what we need to see out of a program. And if I can build on that, I think that the, um, this process of validating these credentials is a critical one. And, and I feel in some ways the odd person out um, when I'm talking with y'all because you, do, you work for a living. I'm at a university. So, you know, the, the whole idea that we are, the whole idea that we are preparing people in any way for jobs. I mean, folks, I, I can get in trouble with enormous quantities, or enormous numbers of people by saying things like that. Yet it's the reality. So one of the things that we are focused on is less of the specifics, will it lead this pathway to this job? We do have certainly a lot of pathways work that we're doing, particularly in areas like healthcare, um, some of the engineering disciplines and the like. But really for us, the goal here is to create a series of credentials, a set of credentials that are portable, that have utility and that are transparent. So that if I walk in right now, what's, why do we like having the degrees we have? It's because if I walk in the door and tell people, yes, I have a PhD from an accredited US university, nobody sits there and goes, well, is that a real PhD though? The fact is it's accepted. You come in with a lot of these credentials we're talking about, particularly when you get below the level of a degree, but even there's stuff well below the level of a certificate. And honestly, they have no portability at all. They, they are useful within the specific region of the specific state. But I moved to Michigan from, from Wisconsin and suddenly all of that stuff is, was, was a waste of time. Or if not a waste of time, because I certainly have the skills, it's gonna require me to go back and do a whole other series of things. So portability, that's a critical piece of this. 
And a big way you create that is through that transparency so that people can see, all right, well, first of all, University of Wisconsin La Crosse does in fact offer that. So here it is. And here are the things that you have to know in order to have been able to successfully do that. So even if it's still a rough process, even if it's a process akin to what we do with transfer in many cases, where people have to look at the thing, at least there's something to look at where you can say, yeah, okay, this makes sense. This seems to fill the same requirements. You can go on to this next step, it, despite the fact that you got this in a state, you know, got this three states over. So I think that's a really kind of key part, part of this. So I would add just from the broader perspective here, um, one of the things we have discussed as very far down the road would be an API for credential engine that would, you'd be able to, to search by, okay, I've got this and it has these outcomes. What else out there is like this? Because then you could say, well, we have, it's called, it's called a certificate here. Oh, but look, the B certificate from there is really 90% the same. Um, we see that coming down the road. And of course, we, you can see this, you, uh, the applications here for transfer portability, et cetera. Right. As far as pathways, um, we have one of our working groups in our um, 12 state um, collaborative and our alliance for, with Credential Engine is a pathways group. And they are just moving ahead. They are mapping every documentable actual pathway in the Midwest. And I think they're up to 800 now, something like that, Sarah. They're just getting them in there. And then those will be able to be traced through Credential Engine eventually. Could I ask a quick follow? I'm sorry. Uh, Please. Just quick follow up. And uh, Ben, I want to uh, double click on what you were saying. So when it comes to portability, and I, I'm a deep believer in portability, I am sometimes troubled to think about what's the cart and what's the horse. Mm -hmm. So is the institution the horse or is the company, the industry, the horse, right? So which is leading which? And so what we typically run into around portability is when that credential hits West Michigan um, and even starting to talk when you start talking Perkins funding and the, and the, some of the things that we spend money on um, I have an employer right now um, that is that has uh, actually has their name on one of our beautiful machining labs, but they also said that is Oz. They love the lab. They said, yeah, but can, we also would like to put a couple of our machines in there because what we need is. And so when you get to that and that machining credential that we're providing in there, they're saying, you know, that's good, but here's what we really need. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, just that idea of the, and so what that does is that shoots for us, it shoots portability in the foot, right? Because we got to then say, great, now let's, let's figure out your machine. So it's, it comes to customized training, but when you get into <clears throat> customized training for three to 400 companies that you have in your region. So I, I fully, I fully appreciate the portability yeah. piece, understanding though, some of those difficulties and I'll and, shut up now I'm talking. To you. And that's what I was saying over to y'all that it's, you know, the, from a university perspective, I mean, we often, you know, frankly, we often ignore exactly that sort of need to be almost ridiculously nimble. I mean, you know, they, you could go back to your office this afternoon and somebody could be sitting there going, what we really need is X, and then you have to stand something up. And universities have not typically worked at that speed. Um, I think we are striving to pick up speed, to gain nimbleness, and I think that the question of the cart and the horse, the, if we create a transparent sort of um, space in which to consider these credentials, I think that facilitates these things. So you can say, look, yeah, I, you would like this very slight difference here, but let's really look at what, the, you know, do a comparison here. And it's not just you pulling out some documents. It's, you know, it's something that we've all shared that, you, know, you can say these other 20 companies have all agreed on this. If you really need it, we can do it, but, but think about it, you know, and, and, and create that conversation. Yeah, and just business is, is in my opinion, um, always the lead in this. Um, that is, that's hard oftentimes for faculty who've come from the industry to remember is that you, you've crossed over into education, now you're an educator. The person working in the field right now is the expert and, and that that's very hard because we all identify with our, our careers 
Um, but we, we have to listen to business and industry. And you never want to speak about people as their products. But at the end of the day, we are producing a product to go to work. And if we're not giving business and industry what they need, they will stop looking to us to give them that. And they will start training on their own. Hi. Uh, I, at it, my advanced age, I've taken courses from uh, Coursera uh, in Python and in data management. But I, if you go on their website, and I'm not advocating for or against them, but uh, how do you feel about their credentialing? Uh, you know, like if you're doing something for Amazon, Google, or things there. Uh, are you duplicating what they're what they're doing or are they duplicating you or who's who's the valid assessor of of their courses like they're 2.8 million people right now taking python yeah you know i can tell you that the work we're doing with credential engine links directly to each one of the programs at each one of the colleges that is kind of direct linkage and there are online, hybrid, and face-to-face -face options available at, available at our community colleges. Now, as far as figuring out if Coursera or any of those other online um, institutions, so to speak, are any good, I have no idea because I haven't taken any of their classes because it's so easy to just go down the road to a local community college and get what I need. And we've got a lot of programs in our state uh, that are custom to the employer's demand or if there's a, a huge demand for a certain type of training, our colleges just develop something within a week and they're producing and getting it out to the public for consumption. So I, I, I can't answer the question as far as if it's any good or not. Um, I hope it is, because I know there are people that are taking those, those um, opportunities online, but I'm hopeful that they'll also look at the colleges that we have in their backyards as well. Yeah, I... I have thoughts on this. Um, I talked to our, uh, the, the gentleman who runs our extended campus, which is our collaborative and online uh, programs, quite some length about exactly this issue. The answer is, our, well, the, the answer is in a question. Are our courses any good? Are, are the badges or certificates we're providing from the University of Wisconsin system any good? The answer is yes, because I've already run down universities too much today during this, but, but, but it's a real question. How do you know? How do you know? And the fact is we lean on our accreditation. We lean on these things, even when the accreditor is not specifically speaking to this badge or this thing. So the answer is Coursera has everything it needs. It is, is a student who's, who works hard in a Coursera course getting the same thing they would get if they worked hard in a, a in-person class? I don't know, maybe not. But it, are they getting something? Are they perhaps mastering the skills that they need to successfully say that they have accomplished what they need to learn Python? Yeah, I, I'd imagine they are. The problem is, and this goes back to the portability thing is, there's nobody saying they are. There is no one certifying that this is in fact what's going on. So this is not a question of how effectively is information being communicated, how effectively is learning going on. It's a question of who vouches for that learning. And that's where we are on this. And I think the credential engine stuff gets us in a place where we at least are saying, okay, Coursera, you, you wanna be counted. Here are the five things you say you can do. Can your students really do that? But you can take courses from Microsoft, and you can take from Amazon yes. and uh, Google. Uh, they all offer courses for advancement. Now, I'm not looking for a job, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I talked to you just before briefly. Yeah. There's a dark side to some of this uh, continuing education too, where uh, I'll take the medical profession. I know a lot about that, that uh, where you get tax-free continuing education courses in the Hawaiian Islands and you can deduct it sponsored by a drug company who's trying to sell you a drug. But that's a dark side because it's a joke. And same with some of the continuing education in, in law. I know I had a daughter the other day taking, you know, renewal and her law license in Nebraska. But it's a joke. 
she tells me, you know, they go for a couple of days, sit there and, and listen to some talking head and, and uh, really don't get a lot out of it or really don't, it doesn't really enhance their ability to be an attorney, so. So I have a, a couple of, again, overarching comments. Um, Credential Engine does work with Google and is attempting to get the Google offered credentials into their database and they do use many Google um, tools to help um, with some of the back end work um, of the database. And in, in a similar vein, I'm sitting on a, a working group now with HLC, um, Susan is too, where um, we are specifically looking at, is there a role for regional accreditors to get into the sub baccalaureate credential um, accreditation game? And it's, it's a, and Roy Swift is leading the panel and we are, you know, we're really trying to dig deeply into that. Do it, does a regional accreditor need to be involved with um, credentials that come from a corporate sponsor or like a Coursera or a Google? Um, and what would that look like? Because um, again, this issue of the quality of the credential is, is huge. I mean, the best we've got right now is um, outcomes. We might not be able to say before um, people go in, yes, there's some quality, but if we have some demonstrable outcomes, that does help us, so. Um, I apologize if you've touched on this, but one of my questions with the work that we're doing is, how do you make it flexible enough, um, but also not so rigid, you know, that it can't change, right? So, and how do you maintain it, you know? Because we all know we've had experience working with systems, right? Where you get it all set up, but then somebody has to make sure that it's fresh and 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 um, maintained. Um, <laughs> and I just wondered if if any of you have thoughts about that and how that you're thinking about that approach in your states. I know each of our states has to maintain it, <laughs> so we're kind of in charge of of making sure it's updated. Um, uploaded the, the most recent information, making sure the, li the links work on each one of the programs. So that's kind of on us as a, as a partner. Um, and in, within our offices, we have multiple people that assist and help and work on that together to make sure, ensure that it's, it's the most up-to-date. In, that in Kansas, what we, we did a lot more work on the front end so that it ease the work on the back end. Um, we tied Credential Engine into our database. So like I said, every night we upload and so it's, it's constantly being changed. So anytime an institution comes into our database, makes a change, changes credentials, anything like that, it, it's uploaded that night. Mm -hmm. And see, we, it's an interesting problem for us because again, there's no one telling us to do this. No state law that says we have to do this a certain way or, or certainly participate in Credential Engine. We see value in it for all the reasons I've talked about. So what we have to do is create incentives that like face down towards our individual institutions and towards individual departments. And part of the way we're doing that is uh, the, it's reflected in system level materials and you know, information products. So our electronic application, you cannot list a degree program unless it is first of all, gone through all the things, but it has to be listed in the database. The database that we have populates that. And we've essentially extended that in our, in our work that we're doing to collect the sub baccalaureate sort of uh, credentials. So what we've said is, look, you can use all of these things. You can advertise on them. You can put them in these things. We can show students pathways. So when you're trying to attract that technical college student and you can say, oh yeah, just look, here's the pathway that will take you from where you are right now to that degree you want and the job you need. So what we're trying to do is orient it so it creates a single path for them to put this stuff into useful products of their own. And then we take the, th the, the databases that we are using for those useful products and we do essentially the same sort of setup that, that the others have mentioned where we simply like upload that into Credential Engine. So Credential Engine is a lot of ways um, a byproduct of a set of processes that we need to have going on anyway. It has its own, I think over time that tail will wag this dog a little bit and we'll get some, some kind of you know, value added beyond the obvious stuff, but that's where we are right now.
picking up on the last point that Bill had about wage and wage threshold. So I guess my question is, particularly as we're looking at perhaps non-credit bearing uh, certifications or badges, have any of your state states set some sort of wage or employment outcome threshold as part of a definition of quality? I recognize that we're, it's sort of, that's like the next step in right now, we're largely doing an inventory of those um, credentials. This is something that our state is, is thinking about and talking about a lot is really isolating um, those certifications that do have demonstrable employment and wage outcomes that would lift someone out of poverty and to pay a living wage. And then basically better aligning our state subsidies to support those very specific credentials, both you know looking at student financial aid to pursue those types of certifications or some of the um, workforce development, we owe a dollars, but we, we have a program called Going Pro, which is a um, employer grant to support upskilling incumbent workers. And the criteria, it's a very competitive grant, but the criteria is pretty loose in terms of what the employee that participates in that training really gets in the long run. So I guess my question is, have you, do you have, um, do you have conversations about wage thresholds um, when actually determining quality? For all of the programs that we offer to the community colleges, we do employment and wage outcomes for every program with the CTE, career and technical education, and then all credit programs. So non-credit CTE and all of the, the credit programs across the community colleges. As far as the wage threshold go, we do have certain programs that have certain wage thresholds. And I'll give an example. Um, the governor has a, what's called the last dollar scholarship that she has um, put some money toward in order for community colleges to pay for or the last dollar for um, any of the credit programs that are Pell eligible. That list of programs is based on, um, well, programs that are crosswalk to high demand jobs. So the high demand job list comes across um, our desk and says, here's, here's the fastest growing with wages above $14 an hour. And these are, the, these are the jobs that we want programs associated with. Our job then at the Department of Ed is to crosswalk those to the programs that are held, community colleges, who has what program, et cetera. So using that, that type of um, criteria has to be over 1% growth or um, 250 over five years jobs um, and $14 an hour or greater for an entry level wage. That criteria is then placed on those programs that are crosswalk to jobs. And then those would be eligible then for that scholarship opportunity. That's one example. And in, in Kansas with our um, career technical education programs, we have went through a process um, that wasn't maybe the most popular, but we re-examined all of our technical programs. Did it meet the definition of a technical program? Did it lead to an occupation requiring less than a baccalaureate degree? And then our third look was, does it end with an occupation that moves a student out of poverty? Um, those programs that were below that got an extra look. So is it a high demand? Um, early childhood is, is one that the wages aren't, aren't there, but the need is there. The, the demand is there. We have to have childcare. Um, certain programs, nurse aid, for example, it, it's a lower wage. But if you look at the program from um, debt to income, a debt to income ratio, it, it, that's not as bad. The student minimal effort on their part can get a job that makes them $20,000, $25,000 a year. Most that is a stepping stone to nursing or some other, other healthcare career. So we made some exceptions, but we do have a threshold of the poverty rate. And if, if those, if we have programs leading to occupations at the poverty rate, rate, we then look at it as, is it an investment that the state should be making? Should, should the state be investing in these programs any longer for the sake of a student being in debt into a program where they're not, they're not gonna move their situation? So the, the short answer is no. The uh, slightly longer answer is, of course, I'm only speaking for the university system. 
and it doesn't tend to be our, our focus. In, and in fact, if we were to raise this as a, we, we do outcomes, we do you know, workforce outcomes and the like down the road, but it is largely separated from the, the kind of academic program design that, that we do. Um, you know, I, I think that they, we try to take into account, but there are no specific thresholds established. Oh, there's one more question or not? No. Nope. I'm so sorry. We don't have um, time for another question, but I'll come over and chat with you and we'll, we'll make sure that we take care of it. Thank you. <clears throat> All great questions. And we, we hope that you understand this is one of the hardest po uh, projects we have to explain to other people. And I feel like you guys have just really helped with that. Thank you. <laughs> That, let's all thank them, please.